as follows. Professor Vitale, Alex Vitale, uh, who beyond being the author of The End of Policing, and I'm reading from the cover of the book, is professor of sociology and coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Book, uh, Brooklyn College in New York City, United States. And his writings about policing have been have appeared in the New York Times, New York Daily News, USA Today, The Nation, and Vice News. He is going to be invited to open the session by um, briefly reflecting upon the book on the current scenario in terms of policing, police reform, defund the police, and additional radical proposals in this field in the US right now. After that, we are going to have three people who have been so kind as to accept the invitation to play the discussion role today. They are Deborah Avila. Um, I'm sure that many of you know Deborah. She has a background in anthropology and she is currently a lecturer in social anthropology at Complutense University of Madrid. And you, Many of you most likely know her because she has been conducting intensive research, Irene, intensive research in the field of policing for many years, together with his sorry, her collaborator, Sergio Garcia. Ismael Cortez has also accepted our invitation, kindly accepted our invitation to be discussing today. Ismael Cortez um, has been research fellow. Hi, Ismael. Has been research fellow at a number of both Spanish and international universities, and has played research. Sorry, has held research and advisory positions in a number of international think tanks before being elected in 2019 as member of the Spanish Parliament for the Incomu Pudem left wing political party. Thank you, Ismael, for, for being here. And together with Deborah and Ismael, we got also Albert Salas, who has also accepted the invitation to be discussing today. And Albert, what can I say? Okay, Albert has a background in political science and sociology. He is, I guess that he is still a young professor at Pompeu, Pompeu Fabra uh, University in Barcelona. And he has held a number of advisory positions with regard to anti-social exclusion and anti-homelessness uh, policies for the local administration of Barcelona. And he's currently affiliated for the, and I don't know this, I gotta consult it, the name exactly, for the Institute, the Studies Regionals and Metropolitans de Barcelona. And um, yeah, all of them are also invited to speak for about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, addressing points related to the book, and um, more generally points related to the uh, current scenario in terms of policing both in Spain and elsewhere. And then after that, we will open the floor for Q&A, discussion, comments, and reflections. Thank you, Alice, for having accepted the invitation. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Ismael. And thank you, you all, for being here. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Alice. Gracias, Jose. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Y uh, gracias uh, a los uh, comentaristas comentaristas <laughs> y uh, gracias para uh, esta invitación uh, and also thank you for allowing me to give this address and uh, discussion in English uh, since my Spanish is not up to the task it is uh, one of the great privileges of being an American academic that uh, we can count on so much of the world to share our language uh, so I wanted to acknowledge this, uh, this privilege. Uh, very happy to join you all today. So in the period about six, seven years ago, when the police killed Mike Brown and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and Sandra Bland and so many others, we were told, don't worry, we're, we're gonna fix the police, we're gonna reform the police. 
The Obama administration created a high level task force on 21st century policing that issued a whole huge raft of reforms. And many cities embrace these reforms. Here in New York City, we got body cameras, implicit bias training, de-escalation training, new oversight mechanisms. The officers involved in the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis had received implicit bias training, mindfulness training, de-escalation training, were wearing body cameras, we're operating under a new, more restrictive use of force policy. We're operating under a new policy that required that officers intervene if they see misconduct by a fellow officer. They were operating under a new early warning system to identify officers with excessive complaints, which some of these officers had. And none of it made any difference. George Floyd's life did not matter to them. And millions of dollars spent on training and oversight failed to protect his life. These reforms are destined for failure because they completely misunderstand the nature of the problem. When confronted with stark racial disparities in the enactment of policing in the United States, we are told the solution is things like implicit bias training, which is widespread in the United States and increasingly popular in Europe and other parts of the world. The premise behind implicit bias training is that the problems of racial disparities and police outcomes are the result of unconscious and unintentional decision-making at the level of individual officers making discretionary decisions about arrest, use of force, racial profiling, and all the rest. But this can't possibly solve the problems. First of all, we have a problem of explicit racism in American policing. We have widespread evidence of police involvement in right-wing nationalists and white supremacist organizations. Whenever we look carefully at police chat boards, discussion groups, Facebook pages, we find openly racist views being expound, expounded. We even have official statements from police union leaders that are clearly racist in their intent. And the idea that a few hours of racial sensitivity lectures is somehow going to transform that is incredibly naive and insulting and is designed to distract people from the real problems. Now, we can't, we can't reduce this problem, however, to just a group of white supremacists or racist police officers, even if we got rid of those officers, we would still have profound racial disparities in policing. And we know this because we have a growing number of departments that are majority non-white officers in places like Washington DC and Baltimore and Detroit, even in Los Angeles and New York City now, the majority of officers are non-white and the leadership of many of these departments is non-white. And it doesn't make sense to say that the racial disparities and outcomes of policing in those places is the result of, of intentional conscious racism by officers, any more than it makes sense to say that it's the result of implicit bias. Instead, we have, a, a two, we have two dimensions of structural racism at work here. One is within the history of policing itself, which is that policing was created to manage the consequences of systems of racial oppression, colonialism, slavery, as well as industrialization, which took the form of the management of immigrant populations who we now think of as white, but were often understood in racialized terms. 
the Irish, the Italians did not have, uh, Jews were not considered white in the period 150 years ago when their immigration to the US begins. So these departments are created to reproduce racial inequalities. And that legacy is very real. And the whole concept of using authoritarian interventions rooted in coercion and control to manage social problems is consistent with that deep history of racialized social control. But I argue there's even a bigger problem, an even bigger structural racism problem, which is embedded in the idea that the problems of black and brown communities have to be understood as crime problems to be managed through policing and incarceration. When wealthier, whiter communities have social problems, those problems get defined as problems of medical care, mental health care, counseling, but when a, so that when a young person in the United States, for instance, in a wealthy suburban high school, a private high school is caught with drugs, no one calls the police because it's understood that the parents don't want the police called because they know nothing good can come from that police involvement for their child. But when a child in a poor, non-white inner city high school is caught with drugs, the police are called. And that young person's life is negatively affected in very concrete ways that have very real and lasting impacts on their life opportunities as a result. And so the decision to flood certain communities with anti-crime units and narcotics units and vice units, because that's where the crime is, invariably reproduces racially disparate outcomes. The totally lawful, procedurally proper, nonviolent, low-level drug arrest is still gonna ruin some young person's life for no good reason. There's no justice in it. And the solution to that is not to give narcotics units more training. It is to end the war on drugs. It is to change the legal frameworks within which police are expected to operate. It is to take that area of practice away from them. We don't need better train homeless outreach police officers. We don't need more training for school police. We don't need them to be nicer, which I argue is not possible. We need them to quit doing those things. And instead, we need to create actual community-based mental health services, hire school counselors, all the things that have been defunded through neoliberal austerity over the last 40 to 50 year period. So we don't have slavery and colonialism in that 19th century sense anymore. We, we barely have industrialization in the United States. What we have is neoliberal austerity. The decision by government in the face of global competition, which they themselves helped facilitate to subsidize the already most successful economic actors in hopes that they will become so competitive on the global stage that some of their wealth will trickle down to the rest of us. But that's not what's happened. What's happened is we've created a class of billionaires and declining standards of living and diminished government services for everyone else, austerity. And this has produced the problems of mass homelessness, mass untreated mental health and substance abuse problems, mass involvement in black market activities like drugs and sex work and stolen goods. And then policing is the tool that we have decided to use to manage those problems, not, not to fix them, 
not to solve them. Policing doesn't do that. It manages them by chasing homeless people out of parks, by chasing drug users off street corners, by chasing kids around schools and driving them into the criminal legal system where their life outcomes are severely diminished. So that analysis has given rise to a new movement that is demanding that we quit naively imagining that training and body cameras and community policing initiatives are going to address the profound inequalities at the root of both crime and disorder in American society. And that instead we invest resources in directly addressing these problems at their root, that we hire more mental health counselors, that we create more drug treatment opportunities, that we address the challenges that families face that produce things like interpersonal violence. So right now, the situation is, is that we have three camps, three political tendencies in the United States. We have the thin blue line crowd, the back the blue, right, the pro-police. This tendency says that the expanded role of police is not only necessary, it's desirable. At root, it is an authoritarian worldview that says that the only thing that keeps society from devolving into total chaos is the constant pressure of legalized coercion. And the most obvious expression of this are things like broken windows policing, which wants to criminalize all problematic disorderly behaviors and it authorizes intensive and invasive police involvement in people's everyday lives if they're poor and politically not powerful. And these forces have completely resisted both efforts to reduce the scope of policing and efforts to reform the police. And those forces were recently successful in blocking federal any effort at federal police reform. But the federal police reforms had very little of value in them, in my view. And this is the second camp, the liberal police reform camp, that accepts the basic frameworks of profound systems of inequality backed up by police power. They are benefiting from the arrangements of neoliberal austerity. These politicians, mostly local mayors, since policing in the U.S. is primarily a local issue, right, have used police to cover up the consequences of their downtown real estate deals and their corporate subsidies that have produced mass homelessness and austerity. And so they are completely opposed to shrinking the scope power and intensity of policing because it serves a political function for them. So that when the police kill people or act in over uh, unjust ways, their response is always, we need to restore legitimacy to policing. We need to restore public trust in the police as if it's our fault for not trusting them. As if we're the ones who need to be fixed through what are essentially a large array of public relations campaigns. Here's your community police officer. Here's how we're doing the training. Here are the body cameras. Here's the new policy. None of which have much of any measurable effect on actual policing. We have a growing body of research that shows that these reforms do nothing. Implicit bias training, body cameras, de-escalation training. There's no evidence any of this stuff makes any difference at all. Because how could it? It completely misunderstands the nature of the problem. And then finally, and I've gone a little long, I apologize. We have the defund the police, police abolition camp that is working in hundreds of cities through local budget processes, processes and community organizing to change the conversation about public safety. 
to make demands that government provide the actual resources that will make their communities healthy and stable and safe places. And they are winning victories. And there are literally hundreds of cities with active movements participating in budget hearings and lobbying city council members. But that kind of stuff doesn't get news coverage. It's not considered national news. And so everyone is reading the obituaries of the defund the police movement because there aren't large explosive protests happening on a daily basis anymore. But I can tell you that that movement is alive and well and making progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. So we move to the second part of this panel session. Um, I cannot see you all right now, but um, Albert and Ismail, are you okay if we begin with Deborah and then Albert and then Ismail? Is that okay for you? Yep, okay. So let me give the floor to Deborah. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, well, my English proficiency is very poor. So first I would like to thank Manu and Branda for the work of translation my speak. And I would like to apologize to you because I have to read the text in my intervention. I have also prepared a PowerPoint with the content of my speech so you can read uh, with me, okay? So I'm going to put... Mm -hmm. Puedo compartir pantalla yo, verdad? Sí. 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 A ver. Okay. Um, well, first of all, let me introduce myself so you can know where I'm speaking from. Um, for almost a decade, we have been concerned about the expansion of the functions, the role, and the scope of police activities. Police in a school, police giving lectures of gender violence to teenagers, police in neighborhood association. This concern has resulted in two, in two war lines. On the one hand, a line of academic research that tries to explain how the police enter into the new social spaces and what effects it is having in terms of the control of population. On the other hand, and in parallel to this research, we were engaged in developing a municipal government program focusing on policy growth in the framework of the community-led political inputs that made Manuela Carmena the mayor in Madrid in 2015. However, once in power, the Madrid progressive government faced significant internal fragmentation and many pressures. In this framework, instead of implementing the police de grow agenda, the local government following a path of police reform. We were monitoring closely this initiative which were aimed at the time a fire police. It is a pity that the end of policing was not just published in those years. Perhaps the city council would not have made the same mistakes that the book identifies, and our own research would have been partly unnecessary because many of the conclusions were we reached consent completely with Alice Vita analysis. Indeed, Reading the book in the light of the, of the experience in Madrid, it is easy to recognize that the local government reform were exactly the same as being described in the first page of the book, orient or oriented forward, self-control and training, diversification within the police, adoption of community policing as a strategy for improvement. Well, following the script to the letter, there are, uh, there are exactly the reforms that Manuela Carmena government undertook in Madrid. Training in human rights to transform an hyper-masculine and warrior-minded police culture. Introduction of mechanisms to limit police actions, such as the Program for Effective Police Identification or the creation of ethic committees. The creation of a specific diversity, diversity manager, management unit specializing in dealing, in dealing with hate and discriminatory crimes 
anti-community policing pilot program. Okay, an assessment of the four years of policy reform in Madrid. First, concerning to the introduction of new mechanisms to limit police action, we believe that the effectiveness of this measure is rather symbolic. It lies more in what the creation communicate, that is the recognition of the existence of institutional violence than in through accounta accountability. Second, much more complex seems to us, however, those reform aimed at eliminating the most repressive elements of police work. In fact, this measure continued a line of reform already present in previous municipal government, which were inspired by the idea of promoting a new police, more preventive and fire. To this end, the city government sought inspiration in social work, presenting a police force that would move move away from warrior culture and resemble the profile for a social worker. This resulted in the production of new figures like guardian agents, mediators of community police, new roles and functions like coordination with social working, trainer in high school, mediation work among neighbors, community policing, and a whole language, networking, participation, community work, important from social work. The effects of this approach are quite worrying and once again, very similar to those underlining at the end of policing. This new police code allowed the police to colonize new areas that were previously of limits, such as a school, neighborhood association, community, co community coordination committees. Second, the police as a social worker approach ignore that they are police. It is not enough to modify, to modify the language and rename the roles because the police redefine the new concept to align them with their essential function, which is control. For example, when police officers are presenting in an attendance commission, they do not adopt a, adopt a social intervention perspective and, and assisting the minor and their family, but a police point of view focusing on obtain, obtaining information about the networks of petty crime in the neighborhood. Third, the close contact that social service maintain with the neighborhood fabric and institution makes much sense for the police. It provides them with a lot of information, an exchange of information that is only one way. And finally, in addition, through this contact, police benefit from a plus of legitimacy. There is a different police, who, do, who they can work it. But in the end, the work of community group ends up subordinated to that the police and its operating logic, which are reporting and extending control. At this point, the question that stuck us was, was the file full of the reforms the real problem? Might we have considered other reforms that could effectively transform the police into something else? Alex Vital, Vitale arcs brilliant in this book. The hardest and most rapid form of police control are not a desviation for their purpose, but the foundation of an institution whose mission is, the, is to underpin another basic on social inequality. The police cannot be asked to make social policy to address problems that inequality generates when their function is precisely to sustain and reproduce that very inequality. In this sense, returning to the initial dichotomy between reform and the growth, we believe that for a radical left, there is no other option than police the growth. However, promoting this option involves addressing two major challenges. First, how do we get people to trust in people's ability to resolve a large part of everyday conflict, especially in a context of high social fragmentation and competition for scarce resources? I was born and lived in a neighborhood in the south of Madrid, one of those neighborhoods always ranking very low in any indicator. Every summer, as a result of the very difficult living condition, conflicts break out in the community. And every summer, I see how sometimes neighborhoods mediate and put an to an end a series of street beating. Or I see how an educator managed to disarm a gang of teenagers. Meanwhile, the police only focus on harassing young people in park and dispersing conflicts. The second challenge has to do precisely to, with recognizing and imagining alternatives to police control. 
with managing to introduce the issue of security into the political agenda of the radical left, but not for a negative position, claiming that the police should not intervene in eviction procedures or should not repress demonstration, but for a proactive point of view, which may envision a different approach to urban conflicts that go beyond political schemes. And that is where we are now. Thank you very much for your presence. Listen to me. Thank you, Deborah. I think that sh you should stop yeah, sharing your screen. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And um, now, Albert, I cannot see you, but I guess that you are there. Yes, I can see you now. OK, Albert, please Hello. take the floor. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, well, let me. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the invitation to the friends of the Grupo de Investigación sobre la historia de la prisión y las instituciones punitivas. And, and I'm very glad to share this virtual space with, with all of you. Um, I read the, the Spanish version of the, of the end of policy in last summer. Uh, and, and I think it's a very important contribution to, to the critical thinking about the social function of the police. No, although it's, uh, it is bright, written uh, from a North American point of view, I think uh, we can share most of the doubts expressed in, in the book about the, the, possi the, the possibility of, of reform of, uh, for, for the police. And, and more or most of the, of the reflections are fully, fully valid in, in Europe. Um, as as uh, Miguel Angel told before, I, I used to, wo to work researching about inequalities and, and poverty, and I am very interested in the criminalization, in the criminalization of extreme poverty and, and homelessness. And in the last years, I have been working as uh, advisor and now ex external advisor for the social services of, of Barcelona City Council. So I have been in a... In, in an interesting position to observe the, the pressures that policymakers face when, when order and security appears in, in discussions. Um, now I, I will take the case of the relationship between homeless people and local governments. And in that sense, uh, I would like to share three ideas. The first one, about the role of, of social workers and, and other social field professionals. Um, changing the actor, but keeping the objective uh, does not transform anything. Mm, I mean, uh, in the last decade, uh, the number of, hom of homeless people in, in European cities has grown very much. In, in the case of Barcelona, the number of, uh, of people sleeping rough in, in the city has gone from 650 in, in 2008 to 1,000 today. Uh, people temporarily housed uh, by a specialized service for homelessness have gone from 1,100 in 2008 to more than 3,000 in 2021. So the visibility of homeless people on the streets uh, has increased, and, and also the and also the, the public sensibility for for this very visible form of poverty. So, neighborhoods uh, demand solu solutions, and and the, because the, the expression of, of extreme poverty on the street are very uncomfortable. Um, whether it's because of the of the nonsense of homeless people uh, or the compassion they produce. Uh, organized or organized civil society groups or individuals uh, turns to municipalities and they demand municipalities to do something. Specifically, um, they request or they require to remove homeless people from the street. And this is the, the, the aim of the, the, the lobby they do to the municipalities. According to the, to the sensitivities or the ideological background of, of people, and there are people who ask for greater police or, or greater police control or, or, greater, or greater social action. 
but at the end, the, the aim is to, to remove homeless from the street. In the case of Barcelona, governments of different, of different, different political colors uh, or political wings have been concerned by the image of the police expelling homeless people from one place to another. Uh, so very often social prof professionals are asked to step in instead of the, the police. At, fear, at, at first, I don't think it's bad. And the problem is that social, interve social intervention requires time, respect, and trust. And when politicians pressured by, by a neighborhood decide to send teams of, of social workers to solve problems of coexistence between citizens and citizens with, with a domicile and the homeless, they must take these factors into account, time, respect, and trust. But they are often required to act as police officers without uniform and without the administrative authorities. So, as I said, it is not enough to change the actor. It's necessary to change the objective of the intervention. On the, on the contrary, we are policing the homeless anyway, but through uh, social workers. And the second idea about looking for a quick fix. Most social problems, in this case, uh, this uh, homeless example, have structural and complex causes. And when we look for a quick fix, uh, the weakest people is, uh, are, uh, are harmed. Mm, I continue with the example of, of, of the homeless. The, the, the cause of homelessness, uh, the causes of homelessness are structural. Uh, job insecurity, weak social protection, exclusion of, uh, of migrants, an exclusive housing market, uh, cities, uh, usually cities deal with this problem through social services and usually providing temporary accommodation until people get uh, an unstable uh, home, home or, or uh, an unstable source, uh, source of income. Um, but local policies or social services cannot uh, stop more and more people falling into poverty. And of course, they cannot guarantee that people who have lived the who have left the, the streets relapse and go back to sleeping rough. The result is that for more people who stay in temporary accommodation, the problem does not remit. So policymakers and politicians know that we need public uh, housing um, and uh, we need public housing, housing first programs uh, to address homelessness, but uh, all new public housing are going to relocate a bit families and, to, and, and, and are covering other big needs in the city. So we don't have, uh, we don't have homes for homelessness. So uh, we continue treating uh, that problem as a social services problem. Anyway, Part of the press, politicians and, and citizens do not, demand, do not demand to solve the problem. They demand not see the problem, not see the homeless people in front of their house. So city councils continue creating shelters and, reduce, and, and reduce, uh, residence, residential centers and outreach teams, and they send social workers uh, to work uh, directly in the street uh, trying to relocate groups of homelessness, uh, groups of homeless from one place to another. So now uh, nobody takes into account if accommodation, if the accommodation and, and, and these temporary shelters really provide a definitive, definitive solution to the homeless, or if on the contrary, they are uh, places where, where people are just stored. So it doesn't matter if the motivation is compassion of rejection, because the reaction to these two situations that cannot be solved end up requiring some form of social control. Um, and the third and, and last idea about the notion of, of the, about the notion of security and the perception of security of, of uh, minorities or marginalized minorities. 
So who demands security and what is, what is security? When, when a disadvantaged population group as the homeless are criminalized, so society asks for protection against this group. But although people require the, pre the presence of, of uh, police or social professionals to, to ensure their safety, the empirical experience indicates that homeless people suffer many more crimes than people who have a home. In fact, speaking with them, uh, one of their daily, daily big concerns is safety. So they are concerned about achieving a certain level of material security, housing income, but they, I, they dedicate a lot, a lot of effort to avoid being victims of robberies, assaults, or, or rapes in the case of women. So despite the complicated relationship between the homeless and the police, perfectly described by, by Alex in, in a chapter of, of his book, uh, I have met some homeless, many homeless people who, who try to stay close to a police station to feel safe. So security is much more complex than protecting a social majority from the so-called so -called dangerous places. So the right to, to feel to feel safe requires policies that go beyond the police. So policies that often have a little connection with the police, with the police. And, and I don't know if I have much more time, but these are the three ideas and I hope, uh, I hope I have not consumed too much time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. It does seem that the scenario is any more prom promising in Barcelona than in Madrid. Let's see what happens with Ismael. So um, Ismael Cortez, MPL, Ismael Cortez, please take the floor. Many thanks for having accepted the invitation. Good afternoon, good night already here in Spain. First of all, I want to thank you very much, the research group of history of prisons for inviting me to this conference, um, it's rather a workshop. Also want to thank you, Deborah, for her talk, Albert, they point out very relevant topics and also Alex Vitale, his book is a very thought provoking one, a very original approach. Although we have to take into consideration the context, the context, contextual differences between United States and Europe, which are quite significant in my point of view. I think Albert and also Deborah raised up um, two important topics. One is about the mission of the police. What is the mission of police in a democratic society as we are? And the second is the issue of providing security for vulnerable and minority peoples or regard to regard minorities and vulnerable people as a security threat. So, and this is, this is a, a dilemma. And, and both models are working simultaneously, as Albert pointed out. I want to focus on the Roma people. I've been doing quite a lot of work in the last five, six years across Europe on Roma. There is a minority spread all across Europe in most of European countries. I've been working with the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe on policing on Roma. And, and first of all, I want, to, I want to give some data about what is the situation of the Romani people in Europe regarding to, to police. So first of all, I have to say that many Roma continue to face discrimination and social exclusion across the European Union, according to different report published by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights and the UNDP. For example, between 60%, um, around 60% of Roma are depending on, on, on public uh, funding, for example. Um, then also want to say about police, that one in three Roma respondents to the UNDP uh, survey 
were stopped by the police in the last year. And then Roma who were stopped by the police were stopped four times more on average than the rest of the population. Then there is also a huge problem of ethnic profiling and Roma. According to the definition published in 2015, 2015 by the Open Society Justice Initiative in the book Reducing Ethnic Policing in the European Union, I quote, ethnic profiling is the practice of using ethnicity, race, national origin or religion as the basis for making law enforcement decisions about persons believed to involve in criminal activity. And I think here I point, pointed out, I point out um, a topic for discussion because I think Albert also um, tackled upon this topic, but I want to make a clarification. It's not the same uh, to deploy surveillance that to deploy repression. And in the case of police on Roma, they do both. They provide surveillance on Roma, basically control, a state control on the Romani population, but they also provide um, repression. And ethnic profiling is just one way of this. But if we go to the fundamental rights report on Roma, we can, we can find so many denounced and trials on different state police, different countries, including in Spain, that has beaten Roma until death. I can quote here the case of um, Thomas Stanisla in Czech Republic, very recent, the case of Spain in North Spain in Tijon with Eleazar Garcia. Recently, the European Court of, um, of Europe also um, make, a, make a fine on, Macedo on North Macedonia for a similar case. This is about the relation between Roma and the police. As you can see, it's a very complicated one. Then the second topic that I, I, want, I want to highlight here is the relation between institutional racism, in this case embodied by the police, and social racism. And I wouldn't tear apart both of them. I wouldn't agree that we have the state police as the bad actor, and then we have um, the nice majority community acting in a good way towards the Roma. In a democratic society, police respond to a social demand. And what is this demand? To provide protection from the dangerous peoples. In my case, what I research is the Roma. And there is a huge demand by majority society to protect themselves from the Roma. And of course, this has an um, economic reason. Yeah, they don't want to be intoxicated by the poor Roma, but this is not enough. We cannot understand racism only by looking at economic decisions. By the way, the World Bank have provided different report and it shows that Roma exclusion has huge cost for European societies. So despite the huge cost of Roma marginalization, still society want to have the Romani people living apart. And for that, they need the police. Talking, for example, about Barcelona, this is a very relevant example. They have a center where drug users can, can go and be safe, so they can intoxicate it themselves in a safe way. Majority society of um, the city center of Barcelona, they were not really happy about having this um, safely center for drug users in the neighborhood. So they decided to put all this complex um, architecture in a Roma neighborhood. So in the margins of the city. In this way, they can have um, let's say the ugly things of the city of Barcelona 
far away from the nice children. And for that, what they need? They need police. Because of course, of, of these, all the issues around drug dealers and drug users provoke from time to time conflicts. And last thing, talking about solution, Deborah said very well, and also Alex Vitali, they, they, they focused their intervention on talking about solutions. In my experience, it's a very complex topic because of course, training can help. I think also diversifying the organization of police can help. In Germany, for example, including more and more Turkish people help to uh, the decreasing of uh, discrimination against uh, the Turkish, but this is not enough. And to me also what is um, a, a topic that we, we, it must, must, be, must be discussed is the, the ethnic profiling and the ethnic census handled by the police. I think this is a very complicated topic um, they are using now artificial intelligence to gather ethnic data. And then on that, building on that, they are criminalizing more and more the Romani people. This is not helping at all. Because whenever someone uh, denounced a crime by the Roma, doesn't matter if the Roma people do it or not, they go to the ethnic census handled by the police and they prosecute the Roma. And I think that's all from my from my side. I will be happy to engage in the deeper discussion. Thank you. Many thanks, Ismael. Um, I wonder whether Alex, you want to address the questions or points, some of the questions or points that have been raised, or you prefer to leave the floor for Q and A or for the discussion. Let me just say maybe a couple of words. Um, mostly, uh, well, first, let me thank the discussants for their thoughtful commentary. And of course, one of the things I love about doing these events is how much that I learn from hearing from folks who are doing work in the different settings that I am visiting. So there has been a lot of discourse in the United States about the necessity of of police to protect vulnerable communities. And so we will often hear discourse uh, saying, well, uh, it is you know, poor communities of color who want the police the most because they experience the most crime. But this accepts the premise that the tool that's available to manage these insecurities is policing and nothing else. So I don't deny that these communities have vulnerabilities that must be addressed. What I question is the idea that police is the best suited tool for addressing those vulnerabilities. So interestingly, you pointed out safe consumption facilities and the need for policing to protect the community that's bearing the burden of those facilities. But of course, the politicians who are making the decision to send the police are the same ones who made the decision to site the facility in a place where there are vulnerabilities. So where's the accountability for that, right? Why isn't the plan for managing safe consumption being produced in a way that reduces those vulnerabilities? That's a planning problem, not a policing problem in my view. Which is, which is not to say that those facilities won't produce some level of disorder or hardship for communities. Of course they will. But we have other mechanisms available in addition to policing to help manage those things. Now, this does speak a little bit to the concern about the policing role that social workers play. And of course, we do want to be careful about that. And that is in some ways, I think, a weakness of the book. It says the end of policing, but the actual content is much more the end of police. Uh, and there are some mentions about the ways in which social workers are being used to manage homelessness 
in a policing style, but I wish I had said more about that. Uh, so I think that what we've seen in Europe is increasingly the use of this language about vulnerable populations to justify expanding police powers. Homeless people, runaway youth, uh, people involved in sex work, folks experiencing mental health crises, people who are drug involved are being labeled vulnerable populations. And then they have become increasingly the subject of police interaction as the strategy. And this is exactly what I'm opposing. We're not addressing why these people are becoming vulnerable in the first place. We are accepting their vulnerability as a given and then using the most expensive and coercive intervention to manage them because it's politically expedient. Well, I look forward to additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. So I think that it is time to open the floor for Q&A and additional comments, remarks, criticisms, challenges. Who wants to be in here? It is evident that there are a number, a huge number of points that may trigger this debate. So who wants to begin?